you can imagine anything you want. So um, I'm Scott Phillips. Uh, I work at Intel on our VSD engineering team. Uh, it's a fairly new team. It's, uh, <coughs> it's existed for uh, just one year now. Uh, Um, and that's that's pretty much as long as I've been working on FreeBSD too. So I, I'm pretty new to it, and um, and so thanks to everybody that's um, that's helped helped us get going. Uh, yeah, hi, Grimmer. <clears throat> so um, so we uh. We want to make um, the BSD OSs, FreeBSD specifically, uh, as good as they can be on, on Intel hardware. And we want to uh, support uh, bugs and security vulnerabilities too. Um, so our engineering work has been exclusively on FreeBSD, and then the, the vulnerability stuff we're, we're trying to engage with uh, the BSD family operating system. So that's why we call ourselves PSD engineering team. And uh, I think uh, also, um, to me, an important thing that we can do is um, connect uh, the community here with people at Intel that you know aren't necessarily working specifically on FreeBSD, but are, are working on um, you know, hardware projects or other operating systems. Um, and so that's that's kind of what I see uh, our job as. Uh, but for for running uh, optimally, I think that that's something that um, you know that, that's obviously a broad thing that's that's not well defined. And so uh, that's something that that uh, I would like to to get feedback from from everybody on like, what problems you're having, um, where you see gaps. Uh, and so here's a slide that we showed at, at MeetBSD that I think kind of illustrates uh, just some of the, the criteria that we're trying to like maximize in the stuff that we do. And some of this is stuff that we uh, know or can see well, and some of it is stuff that, that we can't. And so that's, that's really something that I'd, I'd like to uh, accomplish while I'm here at the conference is just talk to people and, and get a feeling for where you're uh, seeing gaps. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna talk about some of the projects that we've done now. Uh, the first one is uh, a new driver called uh, Hardware Peace State Intel uh, that's uh, uh, let's the uh, hardware performance state uh, uh, system kind of control uh, frequency state. So this goes under the marketing name of uh, Intel speed shift. Um, and, and the idea is that, that instead of having the uh, OS and uh, power be in the loop of, of managing frequency states, uh, you leave that to the processor. So there's a set of um, uh, hints, or knobs that you can set to kind of bound uh, performance or uh, optimize for, for more power efficiency or, or more uh, raw performance. And then, and then you kind of set up your knobs and, and you leave it to the um, processor. And, so it's a fairly simple interface. Um, once you've established your um, your policies, you just sort of let it run. Uh, so the the driver is work that was done by my colleague uh, Ben Wadowski, and uh, it's not it's not yet landed on the tree, but it's it's pretty close. Um, I'll, besides being a new uh, CPU frequency driver. Some changes were needed in the CPU frequency framework. Uh, 
so specifically, um, we needed to kind of update the model so that uh, the CPU frequency framework could kind of understand that a driver might be changing frequencies and, and it, the framework might not be in control. So it, it needs to go and ask the driver if it wants to find out frequency information. And then we also updated uh, CPU frequency so that you can see uh, per core uh, frequency information. <clears throat> So um, the obvious question is what sort of performance characteristics would you see with this? Uh, in broad strokes, it's, it's going to be same-ish as using the uh, speed set driver and power D, especially over you know, longer time periods, like if you're running for seconds or minutes, the, all you can do is just turn the frequency up and turn the frequency down. Where you can see uh, improvements are in the first few milliseconds from idle. So if you have a workload that you uh, are sitting idle and then do a burst of work. So that's a case where the hardware might be able to uh, notice that you're, you're going from idle to needing a lot of uh, compute and uh, turn the frequency up faster. So by default, PowerD is pulling uh, once every 250 milliseconds. Uh, and it, it can turn that down to maybe once every uh, second, even. So, um, so that's a case where you can see a difference. And with the default knob settings, uh, uh, the hardware PC uh, driver is is a little bit more uh, going for efficiency than performance. So you might want to tune that uh, to make sure you're getting the efficiency or performance uh, that you want. And um, in my testing, I saw slightly more uh, residence in uh, the lowest um, processor power states. And I think that's because uh, we don't have power to be uh, waking up the system every second to make sure that still nothing's happening. Um, so another uh, power-related feature uh, that we've worked on is the S0 IX suspend. Uh, this is another feature uh, that was worked on by um, Ben Wadowski. And uh, the idea here is that uh, instead of going to an S3 ACPI state to suspend, you'll stay in the S0 active state, but you will have put devices uh, in their lowest power state. So you'll get uh, effectively the, the same power saving, uh, but with uh, you know, less latency. And um, and one of the big reasons to want support for this feature is there's uh, there's some new laptops coming that don't support the S3 power state. So you're kind of uh, out of luck. If, if you have one of those laptops and you want to be able to suspend. Um, and then there's also um, just a few other little changes uh, that you have to handle some of the stuff that was handled by firmware previously. So making sure that you're, um, you have all of your uh, wake sources properly configured when you're suspending. Are we likely to see that in the stable branches? Or will it really just be the current things you think? Um, I, I don't know. I think this one is a little, so this one's still not merged. And I think it's a little farther out than the hardware P state. So uh, I think it could be a candidate we're going to disable because it's not. I, it's kind of it's kind of fiddly to get it right, and I think it's going to be fiddly to get it right across a, a bunch of laptops. So, um, so I, I think that there's probably some testing to be done before before we can be really sure that we've got we've got all the core cases handled. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so another uh, feature. Uh, that I worked on was support for uh, NVDEN namespaces. So the um, the sort of idea for NVDEN namespaces is that uh, it's serving a similar purpose to NVMe namespaces. You want to carve up your device, um, but the the mechanism is quite different. Uh, NVDEMs uh, show up to the system as just physical address ranges that are 
for non-volatile memory. And so a namespace is just going to be a part of that physical address space that you're treating as a namespace. Um, so, um, and, and also, I think it's worth noting that the, this, uh, the capability of having namespaces and having uh, this label storage area is uh, optional. So not, not all NVDMs are going to have this capability. But the, the way that uh, it's configured are that uh, namespaces are, are defined by a set of labels that go into this separate uh, label storage area. It's, it's a separate address space from the actual data portion of the uh, NVDEM. And I, I pasted a little bit of the, the structure here. This is, this is a set cookie that uh, it's serving a purpose of um, kind of making sure that the, um, the configuration of the NVDIMs uh, is, it matches what the configuration of the namespace is. So, so say somebody took all your NVDIMs and pulled them out and put them in different slots the system needs to know that that's going to wind up as a different uh, layout of memory, and so then it can see that that's not the same namespace, and so that, that's not valid. Um, and then the um, uh, ACPI tables for NVDM namespaces is a kind of uh, convoluted octopus of, of tables, um, and not all of these are, are relevant to all um, all NVDIMs, but uh, the gist is that the, together the SPA range structure and the NVDIM region mapping structure will kind of express the layout of NVDIMs in memory, and then you take that together with the label data to understand how um, how the um, the namespaces are constructed, uh, and so. Um, so we have support for this now. Uh, this is a useful uh, NVDIM feature, but I think uh, for, for nice NVDIM support, we're also going to want uh, a persistent memory file system. Uh, and I'm not super sure what that's gonna look like, so if you've got ideas about that, I, I'd love to talk to you. Um, and then my uh, current project I'm working on is uh, a CI system uh, that will run internally on uh, pre-production devices. And so uh, the idea here is that we want uh, not to send development machines to people that panic early and boot and are just useless. So, so I'd like to keep, um, keep an eye on how our, our pre-production devices are, are working on, on just ahead of the tree uh, and so this is, um, I think, an area where a lot of other people have similar needs and are doing similar things. Uh, so I, I definitely want to talk, if you've got uh, one of these, I'd like to talk to you. Um, maybe we can collaborate or um, you know, share code. And uh, so I'd like to make sure that the functionality is there on these pre-production systems. Uh, once that's done, we might grow into having um, like performance and power measurements that are also being done by the system. Uh, and that's a um, capability that, that Intel provides to the Linux project through its zero-day testing service. So I think that that's, that's something that, uh, that could make sense as well. So, yeah. So do you test all the new CPU architectures in those CI systems? Uh, yeah, so that's the idea is new platforms. Um, all new platforms, so not special ones, so really like Atom, Core, uh, Neon. Yeah, so getting 100% coverage on all platforms could be difficult because there's a lot of platforms, but all, all architectures is something that we can probably do. Does that also get an extent for like graphics and network as well, or is it really around the CPU? Um, I think, yeah, it could probably, um, I haven't really thought of it, but uh, I think basic testing for, for those areas would probably make sense as well. Cool. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of the rundown of the projects that we've uh, been working on. So um, 
if there are any other questions about this before we go on to something something else. Um, all right, so uh, the network guys are, are here today as well. So um, I think Jeb, do you want to say something? Um, I don't have any slides or anything. Just wanted to let you guys know that um, the networking guys are here. Uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, joined by Jeff, Eric, and Jake. Uh, if you have any questions, grab us in the hallway. Uh, we, Jake and Eric, are presenting on BSD Can on Friday for uh, test driven development. Some of the stuff that we've been working on for our hundred gig drive. So um, uh, come by and, and check it out. Interested in. Otherwise, yeah, just pull us aside and, and chat and uh, get to know about it. All right, so, uh, so one other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, some work that I've done on uh, updating the UEFI firmware for Beehive. So um, the motivation here is actually related to the CI system uh, that I want to have. So I, I want to uh, operate the, the um, I want to set up the, the operation of the system uh, in VMs so that I can, I can test and develop the code there. And, um, and I, I needed a, a newer uh, EFI feature to do that. So uh, right now we have uh, the EFI, UEFI EDK2 Beehive uh, package, which is an adaptation of OVMF, the Open Virtual Machine uh, firmware that supports QMU and Zen. And so the, the Beehive package you know, takes that, pulls out the QMU stuff, and, and puts in Beehive stuff. And uh, that's work that was done in 2014, 2015. Um, and then it's mostly just had minor uh, maintenance since then. Um, and if you're using Beehive, you may or may, may not be using this firmware. There's, there's other ways to, to do Beehive. So you, you might be using user boot or something like that. But, um, but I wanted to use uh, UEFI to match the machines that I'm, uh, I'm going to be using in my CI system. Uh, so uh, quite a bit has happened in UEFI since 2014. So we've had. Uh, Actually, four versions of, of the spec have come out now. Um, the latest EDK2 stable tag uh, is up to the 2.7 version of the spec. And, and there have been uh, some new features and, and bug fixes. The one that I'm the most interested in that was an HTTP boot, which came in the 2.5 uh, version of UEFI. And so, um, so I, I went and I did this rebase. Uh, of, of this uh, code. So it's it's something uh, that you can get now and uh, help test out now if you'd like. Uh, it's in uh, the UEFI EDK2 Beehive develop package. Uh, and so it's based forward three or four years. So it was a pretty big update and there are certainly bugs lurking still. So um, if you're interested in UEFI firmware and Beehive, uh, definitely uh, give it a shot and see how it works and, and let me know uh, what bugs you see. So one big bug that it has uh, for sure is that the BSM, that's the, the legacy boot module, um, doesn't work at all. So that's disabled by now. But uh, obviously, that's something that we want to get fixed before we could move it from develop to just stable. Um, and I think keeping this firmware up to date is something that we're wanna, are going to want to do going forward. Um, even in the next tag uh, that's coming soon, there's some features that we'll want, like a, a major update of uh, OpenSSL version and uh, support for our <coughs> tool chain. So um, this is something we're going to want to do. Um, 
And uh, I would like to get support for Beehive just upstream in EDK2. Uh, that is made a bit difficult by uh, the licensing that that project has. So we have uh, BSD2 clause license uh, support for Beehive and uh, EDK2 uh, is moving to uh, a BSD plus patent license for that project. So obviously I can't take someone else's code and then contribute it with a patent license. So, um, so I, I'm not really sure what we'll uh, do there, but um, but I think we definitely, um, to just sort of minimize the pain of keeping this up to date, I think that's something we're going to want to do on an, uh, on an ongoing basis. So, um, so then specifically about uh, HTTP boot, so why, why do I want this versus anything else? Uh, so it has uh, one kind of nice feature for uh, my use case in that uh, it supports a mode where I don't need um, to do any special configuration on the DHCP server. So um, I can program a URL to boot from uh, just locally on the machine in a firmware configuration screen, and then just a normal set of, of networking services will be enough for it to, to fetch that uh, boot package and boot. So um, the, the network that's going to be most convenient for me to host my uh, CI machines is, is one where I'm not going to be controlling the DHCP system. Uh, so, uh, other than that minor point, uh, it's it's quite similar to, to Pixie Boot. If, if you just change um, HTTP for TFTP, then, then it looks just like Pixie Boot. And it does, uh, just as an aside, uh, it does support a mode where the configuration of, of the URL to boot from could come from the DHCP, DHCP server, but that's uh, that's just not the, the mode that I want to use. Um, and then, uh, so doing uh, HTTP boot, it can work in one of two modes. Uh, either it gets an EFI binary or a, a disk image that it will use as a RAM disk to boot from. And, and the RAM disk mode is is pretty simple. All of the loader and everything that we have now can work with this. Um, but uh, there could be, you know, if you were going to use it in the UEFI binary mode where you send over just loader.efi, uh, then you'd probably want to be able to do more HTTP requests with the loader. So I made some sort of proof of concept patches to add that support to the loader. And uh, specifically, the way I did it was using, uh, there are UEFI uh, APIs to use the network stack and HTTP stack that's in the firmware. So um, if we really wanted to go for HTTP support in, in loader, if that's something we wanted, that might not be the way we want to do it. We might actually just want to have the um, I have the code for HTTP uh, in our code base so that we can support, you know, platforms other than UEFI with it. But it's something that's that's there in the firmware, and so um, it's something that we can take advantage of. Uh, and so, um, I guess one other thing is I was kind of mucking about with uh, with this uh, UEFI and, and network booting and, and that type of stuff. Um, I made a, a script to kind of automate the, the network boot flow that I, I think a lot of people do. This is kind of um, a common setup. Uh, but I, uh, I uh, kind of did a, a simple automation of it. So uh, the way it works, I have um, I've uh, built and installed it into some directory here, and then I can uh, just use the scripts. And it 
little startup services for me, uh, such that I can, can do a quick, just run a Beehive VM and boot out of that directory. And then um, I think the really powerful feature is, is something that's still in development. Um, and this is something that I just learned about yesterday from uh, John Baldwin's work, um, where you can use the, uh, uh, there's a GBB. Oh. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, in Beehive, so we can connect to Beehive and then debug the system uh, that way. So let's, let's let it finish. Uh, Booting here, and we can control C here, and we've got uh, our VCPUs. You said we're better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and we can you know just do somewhat normal source debugging stuff. So this um, John's working on this now. It's it's still pretty work in progress stuff, but I think this is going to be a really powerful way to do uh, any kind of kernel development. Uh, if, if your development can work inside the VM. Uh, so I'm really excited about this, and uh, and I wanted to kind of make it easy so everybody can do it this way. So um, so the script is just on uh, my GitLab, and there was one little uh, fix for um, DNS mask that the script uses that there, there was a bug with the CFTP. So I'm, I'm gonna, you know, after the talk, I'll submit that patch, but uh, if, if you're excited about it or something and, and want to try it now, you would need that same patch to use. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much uh, everything I uh, wanted to tell you guys. So are there any questions about uh, anything that I've talked about so far? Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you're trying to get through this week, and so Uh, I've got a BSD can. Okay, so the, the question is, what what's my experience uh, as a person that's kind of new to free BSD? What what's my experience been coming to it, and, and how does it compare? So I've got a BSD can talk where I'm going to be addressing that very question. So, um, so the cliffhanger. <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to go and see. Yeah. You mentioned your new PC driver having a little bit more dynamics and understanding what the frequency changes. Does that include uh, other frequency technologies causing speed changes like speed step and uh, throttling for you know, overheating? Yeah, so so when you're using a hardware PC driver, you kind of uh, you set the bounds for where you want the uh, performance state ranges, and you kind of just hand the steering wheel over to the processor. So uh, it's going to do, you know, um, based on, on those settings, it's going to do the best thing it can. And well, I'm going to talk about feedback about what's actually happening, because the only way I'm aware we can currently do that, there's no specific detail or whatever, is to use the Intel PMC driver to do PMC state checks. So, so the OS is kind of totally out of the loop in frequency control once you're using the hardware PC driver. And I got you, I'm not talking about frequency control, I'm talking about knowing what the frequency